Okay, we um, are going to think about the humanities and the role that plays, uh, the humanities might play in our scientific world. And I think in order to get there, we need to also step back. This is a historical tour. In a way, it's going to be a whistle-stop tour of about 200 years of the relationship and the engagement between the humanities and the sciences. These are both big terms. I'm just going to use them like that throughout. And I'm going to characterize this as a relationship, as you will see uh, as I move on. Let's start, though, with the kind of contemporary position. One vision of, sort of where we are now in the relationship between these two sets of disciplines or fields. Now, the humanities think, I reckon already, that they know uh, a bit about what they offer to the sciences. Uh, I'll give you a minute to read that. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have... Oh, there we go. And this is the role of the humanities, perhaps. Uh, and uh, always nice to have a dinosaur, I think, in a talk. <laughs> there are views, then, from the University of Utah that the humanities might be able to suggest something about why it's a bad idea to do some of the science. That's one perspective, but I want to think about how the humanities are viewed more generally, more broadly, often by the sciences. Now, I don't know what it would, might be like in Birmingham's new library, but when I was an undergraduate, one of the things you would commonly find in areas of the library, um, I was at Edinburgh, and in fact in one particular location in the library, it's bathrooms, you would find this. <laughs> this familiar to anyone else? Yeah. yeah. We've all been here, I think. Um, pool for arts degree. I mean, that should really be degrees, shouldn't it? Um, arts degrees, uh, comma, and a capital P is not very good, is it? But never mind. Um, <laughs> this is often the perspective given on arts and humanities subjects. And I think that, well, these are, are funny. We can um, uh, quite easily um, cast them off as absurd. They make a point about the perspectives of others on the contemporary arts and humanities as subjects, disciplines, areas that we might study as we're all doing and have done. That is that they are in some ways um, worthless. They don't have anything to offer. They are in a sense disposable. And that is, I think, why this becomes such a phenomena. This is a kind of genre in itself, actually. I've probably got about 30 images of um, university <laughs> toilets. Uh, and it's graffiti, very important. It's not Banksy, but it's not bad. <laughs> and these, I think, are interesting because they reflect upon this idea of the disposability of the arts and humanities, the fact that we might not have valuable knowledge of any particular kind. There are other ways, other visions of the contemporary humanities, and they're very easy to find. We can see them everywhere. In fact, I'm looking through uh, my phone on the way here on the train, I discovered a very good example that I could have used if I'd had the time, but I didn't even start looking until the beginning of this month to find a good example of one ways in which the humanities are featured. This is, and I'm going to walk over here so as to play uh, a little bit of sound for you, on the mathematical show More or Less, which uh, is based around statistics, many of you might know this, in the mathematical program on Radio 4, More or Less, they examine the ways in which stats can reveal knowledge about contemporary affairs. And they do this very broadly. And recently, two weeks ago in fact, they investigated um, a report on same-sex divorce and its statistics and were led to uh, draw out a couple of conclusions. ...caught our attention. Divorces of same-sex couples. In England and Wales, same-sex couples have been able to marry for just over four years, since the 29th of March 2014, a few months less than that in Scotland, and it's not currently legal in Northern Ireland. But of course, where there's marriage, there's also divorce. So here's a question. Which same-sex marriages are more likely to end in divorce? Those between men or those between women? The data are clear. About 75% of same-sex divorces have been between women. There have been slightly more marriages between women, but not nearly enough to account for the difference. So, women are getting divorced from women a lot more than men are getting divorced from men. And this isn't just the UK. The same pattern shown in Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Everywhere where there are statistics on same-sex divorce, it's the same sex 
doing the bulk of the divorcing. This made us wonder what was going on. But who could help us with such a question? Right, let me pause it there, because who could help us with such a question? We've got a series of statistics that we've been using here and so far. Lots of stats, broad-based, to get a sense of the view of same-sex divorce. Women are divorcing women more than men are divorcing men. So who could help us with this? Um, actually, I'm just going to let you think about that for a moment. Or in fact, call it out. Who's going to help us with that? Which subject areas might offer us a new view? I'd have said oh, sociologists, maybe, uh, queer studies might. Anyone else? Psychology. Oh, psychology might. Absolutely, yeah, OK, yeah. And on the side of the humanities, perhaps, rather than the, those examining brains, that kind of thing. So that's exactly who I'm thinking. Let's hear. The answer, of course, is, as always, an economist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, quite. That was my response. The answer is always, of course, an economist. And this is a brilliant example, I think, of the elision of the humanities from the production of knowledge. Often you will find that just at the point where you think, well, it's clear that what we want is a social scientist, somebody who might know the history of divorce, perhaps, or the history of sexuality, would be the ideal individual to come in and tell us something about this, to offer a context from another discipline. But the Elision of the humanities is particularly common, and here's a brilliant example of just that. Let's look at um, a further example, shall we? Recently in the conversation, which is a, a, a kind of popular um, academic site for discussion of topics, but accessibly, many of you might know the conversation. Uh, if not, it's well worth having a look at the kind of things that are offered there. One of the recent pieces uh, offered a view of the humanities from the perspective of the sciences, and it was titled Steam Not STEM, Why Scientists Need Arts Training. This was written by a computer scientist largely, and I'm not interested today in, in the STEAM or the STEM and the insertion of arts into science, technology and maths and so on, engineering and maths, but more the perspective they have on what the humanities are. Uh, these slides will be available afterwards. That's why um, I've given you the link to it. I'm not going to link to it now, but I am going to call up what this writer suggests the humanities are good for. And so he writes, I believe we need our educational system to engage students with issues of ethics and responsibility in science and technology. We should treat required arts and humanities courses not as some vague attempt to broaden minds, but rather as a necessary discussion of morals, values, ethics, and responsibility. And how else do our universities teach empathy, ethics, and citizenship? Ignore for a moment why that's different from the previous three things. Than through our arts and humanities fields. That seems an important and in many ways reasonably sage kind of statement about the role the humanities might play. And uh, the whole article gives you a context for the thinking that emerges from that. Uh, now, I don't know what you might make of this kind of perspective on the arts and humanities, but it certainly does uh, a few things to them. I mean, I have my view and um, I, think, I think this uh, about it. And says, no, this is not the view that one should be taking of the arts and humanities. We are not there, if you like. Well, there are two problems with this. One, I don't think that the arts and humanities are there to provide us with a sense of, of ethics, of a kind of emotional sensibility or citizenship, on the one hand. And secondly, how demeaning to scientists. I imagine there are many scientists who are quite happy in working out their own ethical principles and can use those to inform their research. So it's problematic on both sides, I think. Uh, and surely our response to that vision of the humanities also has to be, no, that's not how we want to think about it. So there are problems now, and certainly in some ways, about how we envision the role of the humanities and what it is that they do. And we forget, I think, that the humanities offer us forms of interesting evidence. None of that came up and that they offer us access, and I use particularly scientific terms here, to truth in ways 
uh, that we really should be more aware of and understand better and are able to advocate for. I'm going to come all the way back to all of this after we've gone back 200 years to think about some of the history. Remembering it's a relationship, we're beginning here, in around 1800. And this is the Whistle Stop Tour now. In this, from 1760 to about 1820, the humanities and the arts and the sciences seemed quite closely connected. Wordsworth, for example, in writing about the relationship between the poet, poetry, and the scientist and the sciences, said the following. The poet considers man and nature as essentially adapted to each other. And the mind of man is naturally the mirror of the fairest and most interesting properties of nature. And thus, the poet, prompted by this feeling of pleasure, which accompanies him through the whole course of his studies, converses with general nature with affections akin to those which, through labour and length of time, the man of science, and forgive them speaking in these gendered terms, has raised up in himself by conversing with those particular parts of nature which are the objects of his studies. I.e., I, says Wordsworth, and the scientist are interested in the same things. We have the same pleasures, and we come at it through different methods, but we are joined in our pleasure of the natural world, for example. There were lots of other examples. In art, there were images of science at work that revealed the curiosity and the wonder. This is Joseph Wright of Derby, 1768 print, uh, um, painting an experiment upon a bird in the air pump, in which uh, he shows us the scientist, experimenter, and the various reactions to it the curiosity and astonishment, the fear and concern, the disinterest because there's a bit of a love match going on, all sorts of things in that painting. But it shows us, I think, the interest of the sciences from the perspective of the artist and a sense of the engagement of the two fields. Similarly, we have someone like Humphrey Davy, who was, of course, well known as a chemist, but also as a writer of poetry. So that in his, his, his journals, here's a picture, an image of um, his reflections on breathing in nitrous oxide, laughing gas. He writes similarly in the journal of a piece of scientific experimentation, a chemical experiment. And on the following page, he'll begin a poem on the nitrous oxide, which he'll continue later. This was a kind of collaboration between the sciences and the arts uh, that was entirely common and to Humphrey Davy and many others, natural. Mary Shelley, it's, you cannot go through 2018 and the anniversary of Frankenstein without mentioning Mary Shelley in every talk. Well, I can't. Uh, Frankenstein was another of these pieces of work where we have the humanities, the writer, the creative writer, working with contemporary knowledge in the sciences to imagine its repercussions in the world, in the social world, the real world, outside of the laboratory. Uh, and that's exactly what Frankenstein begins to do, is to examine the ways in which the sciences uh, might function in a wider laboratory uh, than the ones um, being undertaken um, in Italy and in um, hospitals in London to examine the nature of life and its vitalities. So many different forms of collaboration between the arts, the humanities and the sciences, which might lead us to wonder, uh, on one final example, which is a fantastic example, I think, uh, and commonly known, is the word scientist itself, which was coined here by Huell, uh, writing uh, on induction and methodology in the sciences in 1833, who drew from Coleridge the comparison with the word artist. Scientist, as a term, drew upon the word artist uh, and while it took a time for that to emerge as the term to be used to describe those interested in what we now think of as the sciences, that's where it began. And it was in a review he wrote of Mary Somerville, one of the um, best known of the, the female scientists of this period, in a review of her work on in the inductive sciences that Huell first suggested it as the term to use about the natural philosopher or the savant. Uh, terms which he thought didn't quite work, no longer was science associated with um, philosophy in the same way, and savant was simply too French uh, for us to use in Britain. So scientist and artist linked together. 
But it didn't stay that way. Section two. <laughs> By the 1880s, there was the beginnings of a kind of fissure. So that T.H. Huxley and Matthew Arnold spat over the relationship in education between the sciences and the humanities is, um, I think, something that was already coming and you could see replicated elsewhere. Um, I choose this example because Huxley uh, articulated his sense of the importance of the sciences over a classical education, an arts and humanities education, here in Birmingham at Mason Science College, uh, which was, um, there it is, uh, in which he said, for the purposes of attaining real culture, an exclusively scientific education is at least as effectual as an exclusively literary education. He was thinking broadly about literature there in terms of classical education, study of the ancient world. Uh, here um, in central Birmingham, this was demolished to make way for some of the foundations of what became the central library, which has also now been demolished, hasn't it, again? Seems to be something going on here. I've seen it on your own campus, actually. There's a lot of this going on. Uh, here in Birmingham, he offered this perspective. He said, neither the discipline nor the subject matter of classical education is of such direct value to the student of physical science as to justify the expenditure of valuable time upon either. These opinions, he says, that is the importance of the sciences, especially the latter, that really we should be now focused on physical science in our education, are diametrically opposed to those of the great majority of educated Englishmen, um, silently in brackets, who are wrong in his view. They hold that the man who has learned Latin and Greek is educated. Now, his interlocutor, Matthew Arnold, great defender of the arts and humanities, responded and in a very particular way to this view that really we should be turning away from arts and humanities subjects and looking more at the sciences by arguing that actually, and this was a very clever but somewhat circular argument, actually the study of some parts of the arts and humanities is also the study of the sciences. Literature, he says, is a large word. It may mean everything written with letters or printed in a book. Euclid's Elements and Newton's Principia are thus literature, etc. And so by knowing modern nations, we might know also what has been done by such men as Copernicus, Galileo, Newton and Darwin. So he's suggesting that actually the study of the humanities might also be thought of as the study of the sciences. He's looking also um, in the ways that Wordsworth did at opportunities for collaboration and connection, the kind of thing that was being broken down perhaps by Huxley. <laughs> by the middle of the 20th century, C.P. Snow in his very famous work on the two cultures, you all heard of the two cultures, uh, there's a bit of shaking of heads, so not totally wasted three minutes. C.P. Snow, here he is. I love this picture because who can attend a conference and smoke a cigarette nowadays? I mean, that's marvellous. So it's 1959, C.P. Snow is there giving a lecture in Cambridge on what he calls the two cultures. At this lecture, Snow, a physicist and novelist, who might, you think, uh, be one who bridges the divide between the disciplines, says that we now have two cultures at work, literary intellectuals at one pole and at the other scientists. Between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension, sometimes hostility and dislike, but most of all, a lack of understanding. We've moved on from Huxley's suggestion here to a more vociferous approach in which the, there's no understanding between these different disciplines any longer. Once or twice, says Snow, in what is a very famous example of this gap, I've asked the company, he means of literary scholars, how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is about the scientific equivalent of have you read a work of Shakespeare's? This famous example of the lack of knowledge, perhaps especially the lack of the knowledge of science on the part of the humanist, is what Snow picks up on here. Uh, now, if any of you are in the audience in our social sciences and thinking, where are we in all of this? <laughs> Snow did recognize that he was leaving out a whole area of disciplinary work, the social sciences. And I'm not talking about that today. However, I did think it was worth mentioning that he 
um, was criticised perhaps by his American sociological friends who've said that they vigorously refused to be corralled in a cultural box with people they wouldn't be seen dead with. <laughs> that was a view from the sociologists. And Snow, as Nicholas Treadle uh, tells us, um, argued eventually in a later publication that maybe there was another way, a third culture, as he called it, in which we could combine an awareness of the depths of the human condition with social responsibility and optimism uh, so that the sciences, the social sciences, the humanities might all work together. This, I think, is an important and interesting comment. It was in some ways quite prophetic. We'll return to that in a moment or two. Snow was also criticised by another figure, by F.R. Leavis, who responded with the same titled work, The Two Cultures, but with a question mark at the end, in 1962. You can tell that he is the artist and humanities scholar because of his enormous collar. <laughs> if we skip back, there's Snow, look, buttoned up. And there's Leavis, oh yes. Now this vast collar helped Leavis make a particular kind of criticism of Snow. And it was very personal, and actually it didn't do him any favours in the end. He said, not only is Snow, he, not a genius, he is intellectually as undistinguished as it is possible to be. So he was pulling no punches. But despite that, he went on to say things that I think are more interesting, but which have been slightly forgotten in this uh, uh, fight between the two of them, and in Leavis's um, rather childish responses. He said that there might be a realm, a realm, a kind of third culture, perhaps, as Snow later said, of that which is nearly, neither merely private and personal nor public, in the sense that it can be brought into the laboratory and pointed to. Perhaps in this other realm, a meeting point in the middle, there is a place where minds can meet in a collaborative, creative process which brings a cultural community or consciousness into being. So again, a sense in which there might be somewhere where we could work together and across the disciplines, scientists and humanists uh, collaborating somehow. By the 90s, things had got to a really terrible situation. And the science wars of 1996 articulated that very well. The science wars, for those of you who don't know this, were uh, a number of different debates which I'm gathering together uh, under one heading here. And that was when this writer here, Alan Sokal, uh, who was frustrated by the ways in which philosophers and literary scholars were, in his view, abusing the sciences and the knowledge produced in the sciences and were essentially writing nonsense using lots of scientific ideas. Uh, he got to the end of his tether and he submitted to the journal Social Text a fake article. Never consider this, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> he submitted a fake article which, as you can see here, was called Transgressing the Boundaries Towards the Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Physics. This article was, to put it bluntly, bullshit. <laughs> he'd made it all up. He'd followed a kind of postmodern formula to make it sound as though he was one of these new philosophers employed to think about the sciences. It was published. It was accepted and published. And so Carl then gloated about how this, the humanities had no rigor, no method, and they accepted this fake piece of work in what was a very significant journal. And he went on to write a book about it, I didn't mind using uh, the word bullshit because he himself here called the merd hits the fan is how it was described uh, in the, I think, by the Evening Standard. So Carl's point was a serious one, uh, although I'd say probably somewhat misguided. He argued that there is a view amongst the humanities that science is nothing more than a narration, a myth, a social construction. It's just not true, he said. They shamelessly, arts and humanities scholars, throw around technical terms manipulating phrases that were meaningless and importing concepts from the natural sciences into the humanities and social sciences without giving the slightest conceptual or empirical justification. Science is not, he argued, a mere reservoir of metaphors ready to be used. Scientific theories, he says in a very famous line, are not like novels. In a scientific context, these words have specific meanings which differ in subtle but crucial ways from their everyday meaning and which can only be understood within a complex web of theory and experiment. 
If one uses them only as metaphors, one is easily led to nonsensical conclusions. This is probably the low point, and it's a continuation, I hope you can see, of the narrative I'm trying to offer you here, in which the humanities are constructed as not subtle, lacking in complexity, uh, unable to um, provide us with anything that might be seen as, as truth or evidence, because they have neither theory nor experiment. This is a continuing theme. But, at the end of the 1990s, a new view began to emerge. A view in which maybe there was a potential for what Edward O. Wilson here calls consilience. Now this is more like it, isn't it? Here's a someone writing, a heavyweight scientist, about the opportunities for humanities and sciences to work together. This is probably the way forward. And here we are in 1998. Sadly, not really. Consilience for Wilson is to become more like the sciences. The humanities, if they want to have uh, any kind of purchase in the contemporary world, need to become more scientific. As he says, the only way either to establish or to refute consilience is by methods developed in the natural sciences. We need, he says, a reinvigoration of interpretation with the knowledge of science and its proprietary sense of the future. Remember that phrase, I'm going to come back to the future. Can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit later, or is it earlier? It could be both. <laughs> he says we need to study works of art with knowledge of the biologically evolved epigenetic rules that guide them, i.e. the way to understanding um, might not be, for example, to get a humanities degree, work for a number of years on poetry and gain a great deal of uh, information. No, no, no. It's to become more biological in our understanding, to be more scientific about it. So this kind of consilience is not so much consilience as, I suppose, assimilation. This is E.O. Wilson as the Borg, in which he <laughs> takes in the humanities and changes them into something else, and that that's how they might improve. Now, this kind of thing is also spoken about by someone like Steven Pinker, and as recently as August 2013. Um, now, so just a warning here. What you're about to read, you're not going to like. <laughs> if you're a humanities scholar of any sort, you're going to dislike this immensely. Pinker, in a piece called Science is Not Your Enemy, which sounds conciliatory, but we need to be careful of consilience, uh, writes, the humanities, he says, have failed to define a progressive agenda. Several university presidents and provosts have lamented to me, anecdotally, he notes, I'd like to see his footnotes, <laughs> that when a scientist comes into their office, it's to announce some exciting new research opportunity and demand the resources to pursue it. When a humanities scholar drops by, it's to plead for respect for the way things have always been done. You can see the difference, can't you, very clearly. I mean, this is hideous, of course, but he is thinking of the striving adventurer, the masculine scientist, uh, and he's opposing that with the humanities scholar, who has none of that kind of elan, drive, or sense of purpose. On he goes to say, if only the humanities would enjoy, to, if only the humanities could understand that they would progress if they could enjoy more of the explanatory depth of the sciences, to say nothing of the kind of a progressive agenda that appeals to deans and donors. Like Wilson then, Pinker argues that if only you could be more like us, you'd have explanatory depth and you'd get the cash as well and universities would love you. All the things surely that they want, it's revealingly uh, certainly what he wishes. And what could the sciences do in turn? Well, of course he says, they could challenge their theories with the natural experiments and ecologically valid phenomena that have been so richly characterised by humanists. That's the best he could do, is that the scientists could think a little bit more about the stuff they already do. Thank you very much. That's kind of you to help out a bit. And that kind of view in which the humanities become handmaidens to scientific work, helping and supporting that aspect, that research, 
is a very common phenomena, again, as you can see, back here in our present day. <laughs> but, let's go back to our first question and back to the present. What role do the humanities actually play in our scientific world with all of this problematic history across 200 years? Starting out, if you like, with the romantics and their perspectives on the ways in which they can work together and then decimated by 180 years or so um, of alternative perspectives in which the humanities have, have kind of lost, in a sense, the battle for things like truth and evidence and are widely regarded as no longer offering those, as that though the sciences themselves were the ones who can actually achieve new knowledge and provide answers to challenges. Now, I would say that is a really quite pervasive contemporary view uh, of where we are at. So what role do the humanities play? Well, in 2015 at least, nature, nature, argued that if you want science to deliver for society through commerce, government or philanthropy, you need to support a capacity to understand that society that is as deep as your capacity to understand the science. This is, I think, opening up another vision for us in which we can see the humanities and the social sciences as hugely important in approaching kind of any kind of contemporary challenge. That no longer are the things that we need to address about our world accessible only to one set of disciplines, the sciences. It is vital that we work together across all the different disciplines of the arts and humanities, social sciences and the sciences to meet some of these challenges. How might we do that? Well, one set of ways in which we can do that has been what I've been investigating in um, the Cardiff Science Humanities Project that John mentioned in Kai very kindly in his introduction. We've been conducting uh, a series of small projects um, which have investigated existing projects that look at ways of working between the humanities and the sciences. And so I, for the rest of my talk, which is about five minutes or so, I'm drawing on that data to think through some of the ways in which the humanities, social sciences and sciences do and can work together. And here's three views. One, for example, history. We need to understand histories to be able to inform the present. And there are ways in which this kind of thing is going on now in interesting new ways, uh, which I'll show you. There is a re-energizing of what experiment might actually mean. That is a reclamation, if you will, of the word experiment back from the sciences and into arts and humanities. Uh, after all, we've never lost the term experimental novel. So why should we hand over experiment uh, in other ways? And to, uh, in some ways, reject some of the earlier comments of, uh, uh, of Wilson, uh, Pinker and Snow, there is a way in which arts and humanities often are involved now in assessing the future in, I think, hugely important and interesting ways that enable us to think through and conceptualise how we might address some of the major challenges that face us as a, as a global society. For example, in informing the present, there are ways in which one can engage with the sciences and add to that an historical element that contributes to new ways of thinking. I'm going to use two examples from two people in the room, because why not? Um, one of them is mine, so that was easy. Uh, I work on sleep, and I work with a sleep laboratory. Note, this is not a real patient, this is a stock image. Um, <laughs> I work with a sleep laboratory investigating uh, the ways in which sleep can help us to, uh, to increase our memory capacity and might be one way of supporting new uh, research into combating some of the problems of ageing, for example. And my ethnography of the sleep lab, my investigations with contemporary sleep science, has enabled me to provide additional historical data for these experiments drawn on lots of case notes from medical journals from the 1870s onwards uh, that focus on specific individuals who had specific kind of sleep pathologies. 
And these are now being used to reinform some of the experimental practices going on in the laboratory. At the same, um, a similar example would be John Holmes's project on evolution and the evolutionary epic, in which John is drawing upon epic traditions in literature and narratives, scientific as well as other narratives, about evolution. And that the, an, an understanding of the epic tradition in, e, in evolutionary narrative writing shows us how it has influenced scientific thinking about how evolution works, as well as uh, the ways in which that's been represented in other media forms, literature, film, etc. These are just two examples of many. There are some terrific stuff going on um, in Lancaster, uh, for example, on, uh, on medieval plants and how they can offer us access to new pharmacologies uh, that we have lost knowledge of and can be returned to us uh, if we can put together the right chemists with the right medieval scholar. There's lots of examples of this. So histories informing the present is one way one might go with one humanities or two humanities subjects, history and literature. There is also a sense, however, that the experiment has become much more open and is now understood as something that can be undertaken by social sciences and humanities scholars as well as by scientists. The quotations here are from Patricia Wall, writing recently about this in a, a work on uh, medical humanities, in which she argues that there is lots of new interesting work, especially in genetics, that reveals to us that experimental practice is no longer narrow and controlled. It doesn't just happen in laboratories. It's now open and exploratory. It involves the relationship to the environment, to the external world, and that these are proving to be um, really rich new ways of conceiving of the idea of an experimental practice that can still provide us with some kind of epistemic knowledge. It's a consideration, as she argues, uh, slightly jargonistically, of the material discursive organisation of knowledge systems. That is, there are several different disciplines that can all productively inform new scientific experiments. And thirdly, the future is not only owned by science. Far from it. Uh, the future is being investigated in lots of ways, and I've decided just to focus on climate science. Uh, the future is being modelled, of course, by computer scientists and climatologists all the time. They're so good at this that the future is actually getting further away from us because we can say an awful lot about the near future, but less about what's slightly further down the line. And that's where science fiction or indeed other kinds of literary works can help us, uh, can raise awareness, can allow us to think further about climate change and investigate some of its repercussions. And I'm giving you an art installation here on the right in New York. You can see the city in Manhattan in the background. Uh, raising some kind of awareness, making us uh, understand that climate change is at work here and now. Climate change at work. McEwan's Solar, Barbara Kingsolver's extraordinary novel, Flight Behaviour, are other examples of a kind of alternative near future that uh, is a rich way of experimenting, Patricia Wall might say, uh, with ideas uh, that might lead us to understand climate better, and to offer some new solutions to it. Let me conclude then by saying what this allows, I think, the humanities involvement with the sciences now, is that we're able in investigating things like climate change or aging or evolution, all the examples I've given, the humanities enable us to broaden our methodological capacity. We can use new and other ways of thinking. We can redefine evidence as subjective, not just objective. And we can assess subjective evidence using the methodological capacities of the humanities and the arts. And we can extend the parameters of truth that I think had been narrowed, very much narrowed, to numerical answers emerging from um, experimentation, for example, and see truth as something beyond that, something much more capacious but still important in that capaciousness. And back almost to the start and also the end, when we return to this. I would now say 
we probably don't want to accept that, however fun that is, and that, I think that's great. This idea of the humanities responding to the sciences, only ever reacting, is one of its problems. And one of the contemporary perspectives of it is only that it can just kind of help out a bit. So let's just side that over there and look in some new ways. What do the humanities offer us? Different conceptual options for tackling problems. Humanities and art have reflective capacity that makes others think differently. This is all data, by the way, coming from our project. They have qualitative value that can sit alongside quantitative value in important ways and equally. And it extends empirical reasoning into other realms that are enormously helpful. How do you do that, though? I mean, that's a really difficult question to answer. But those we've spoken to suggest that the best way forward is to jointly focus on a common or shared problem. Maybe what F.R. Leavis called that space for the meeting of minds, or what Snow called the third culture. You work closely with somebody nearby. You generate a relationship with them. And here, I imagine your liberal arts and natural sciences program is ideal for this kind of way of working. You immerse yourself in each other's subjects to extend your understanding and to gain an empathy, and I'd also say a respect for alternative ways of working. And you don't worry too much about labels. Uh, many, many of you will have thought, are we interdisciplinary? Are we transdisciplinary? Are we multidisciplinary? Are we co-disciplinary? Are we even disciplinary? Are we undisciplinary? <laughs> the projects we've looked at couldn't give a monkeys about any of this. They don't worry about labels. They focus on the work. And let those of us interested in interdisciplinarity worry about the labels. Do the work and see what emerges from it. Uh, and that, I think, is my end point. Thank you.